was ridiculous. The one time I bet against them, and they won. I don't even know what happened. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, for sure next time we're going to bet the one. I don't even know this time. I got it, babe. Hey, babe. Ah! Holy shit! Ah! Ah! What are you doing? Babe! Ah! Hey, neighbor. You need help? <laughs> hey. Hi. I don't mean to drop in on you like this, but... John called me. He was hearing some screams coming from your apartment. It's okay. Um, everything's fine. You know you can tell me if something is going on, right? Okay. Right. Well, I still need to see you. No. 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 I'm afraid I have to insist.
Um, what's that smell? Hey! I just came from your place, but no one was there. Is is Jack home now? I, I don't know. No. Hmm. That's okay. I'll just come with you. I'm not going straight home. I... It's okay. I'll come with you. You're going home, right? I'm not going home. I'm not. I'll just go wherever you're going. No. Try the car, woman.
To define the Caribbean Sea, we must find the chain link together by dogma of invasion and separation, colonialization. We must speak of it indigenously to our ancestry then slavery before being dragged to the Americas, the black birth land was Africa. The Latin flame was sparked in Spain. The French by no chance come from France. And we Asian cousins was imported from China by the dozens. People of Spain, France, Africa, children of the colonial master, the deal was made. Blacks tortured, overworked and unpaid. Gotta call a spade a spade. Like cane, tobacco and cotton dropped off on the triangle trade triangular motion world system theory world systematic foolery a need to analyze its core rob your blind burglary attack from behind buggery outside peripheral vision can't see in a bad position periphery neither here nor there semi but hail to saint lf dominique hail haiti a French and African ancestry, inspiring transcendence, pioneers of independence, a fight from 1791 to 1804, before AST was gone, before the Harlem Renaissance. Now we freed Haitians, judging their practices, but embraced the Catholics, burning them incense. White supremacy, white supremacist, white straight hair Jesus on a crucifix. Tell me, we don't want licks. We're going to mention Amalek Garvey, leader, visionary. He raised black value, reshaped black mentality. We was black and nauseous. We was black and anxious. We was black and cautious. Now we black and audacious, black conscious. He predicted the reign of Selassie, spark revolution, Rastafari, the main tree, Bobo Shanti, 12 tribes, and Nayabingi, Rastaman vibrations, Rastaman studiation, Rastaman meditation, operation, condemning, comb here, statistication. Without admission, the Rastaman transformed the whole region. Three black men in Paris. Caesar, Sengar, and Damas, smart and scholarly, educating lyrically, intellectually using poetry, ignoring the white masses, a new black destiny, enlightened black artistry, aware black history telling the truth, negritude, going against black servitude, elevating the black attitude. So when they ask me about the future of the Caribbean, see, this is what you see, an influx of money, a boost in the economy, a shift from tourism dependency, depending on if we could depend on each other, looking after your brother called our keeper, a mixture of flavor that beyond salt and pepper, cause here seen, ain't no flavor like the Caribbean. This is why they exploit we shores and scenery, one of the world region's most photographed, picturesque and choreographed. Them arrive at their luxury, but to go where them from, we got to get draft, get some chalk and do the math. For the future I see, we traveling between islands freely by direct flight or ferry, depending on the proximity, with a certain courtesy, with a certain ease, with a certain embrace from the receiving country. For the future I see, we as more than just Christian, who mention dissatisfaction of people's sexual relations, judging a man addiction, judging fornication, becoming common law. Look, just watch the heart of a person cause we is all in laws. For the future I see regional political maturity and face players in this political monopoly, political polygamy, one leader, several to I see a camaraderie, governing teammates, political indies. Some say this impossible, but it plausible, mission possible. Check the CCJ for example. For the future, I see multiple intelligences, pedagogy, producing creators, creating their content, making them contented as well, being that regurgitation in education, making the youth docile consumers of things foreign, denying them their abilities to be producers, self-made with the powers to end exploiters, supreme reign, claiming we sure's, cause now we sure of the hopes and dreams for the Caribbean, futuristically.
I'm coming in now, okay? I'm going to turn on the light so your eyes can adjust now. Are you ready to talk? I should have seen them from the start. The signs, the signs were there from the start. From the start, from the start, from the start. Mother didn't like him. Trent, come in here now. What's wrong, Billy? His brother she is nothing. What? You didn't what? like me. Well, come on, go. On. I'm finished. Michael, I'm listen. finished. No, listen. No, you know nothing. I'm finished. And all we wanted was to be free, free to love and make it last. I told him everything. Like, I've always wanted to go to Brazil. Brazil. The food, the music, oh, and the dancing. Like, oh my goodness. He told me he'd take me there one day. I mean, like. Maybe I'll take you there someday. He I promise. promise. Will, you, will you marry me? Everyone thought we were too young. We thought our love was secure and sound. The beginning was filled with so much promise. His actions were pure and honest. Dreams are gone and reality seeps in. And I knew was lost within. It happened that day when I saw his face.
What did he want? It's not what he wanted me. That's what we need. It was that night. That night. It was that night I followed him out. Proof was what I needed to bargain back for his soul. I found proof, but no bargain. Brazil. It's okay. Whoever he is, he can't get you here. Think of some place. Some place happy, some place special. Brazil? Brazil! 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 Brazil. I think God created every man in his image and likeness. And I think it's, it's a choice that, you know, that person wants to live that kind of lifestyle. I don't think that, that they were born that way. It's hard to define what father going through and how he feel. But he body or she body, you see? Me or you probably outside, we, we will have our own opinion. But them going over, them going through. If he born as a full man, you understand me, and he wanted to go over, no. 
No, no. I know for a fact it's not a choice because who wants to hate themselves, you know what I mean? Who wants to feel uncomfortable every day of their life? No one actually wants that. So to choose that is absolutely ridiculous to me. Part of how we know ourselves lies in how we see our gender. I simply didn't feel comfortable in the male outfit, the pants and the, the shirt. I just didn't like it. It wasn't that it didn't fit properly or, you know, it was too small, too tight, too big. I just didn't like how it felt on me. I never felt like I was a boy and clearly my wardrobe after 17 was nothing masculine. What if your six-year-old son came home and said, Mom, I am a girl. In this documentary, Alexa and Raven share their stories on the challenges of living as transgender in Barbados. To understand their stories, we must first know what is gender dysphoria. People used to talk about gender identity disorder. Uh, we have moved from that over the last few years, and now we are looking at that somebody is who they are. They have the emotions they have, they have the feelings they have, the physical structure they have, but they have problems with what is going on as far as their gender orientation is concerned in their own space. It is not something that somebody else can look and see. So that is really what we're talking about when we talk about gender dysphoria. Raven tells us about her struggle with gender identity from an early age. Growing up, I was always very feminine according to my neighbors and going through life with my family, it wasn't like, I was never told, oh, you're too girly or you're too boyish, that doesn't make sense, but yeah. I was never told I was too feminine, so um, growing up. I found myself more gravitating towards the female students. So I would rather sit and talk with them, hang out with them, um, you know, carry on a full conversation with them and staying farther away from most of the male students, unless they were male students that I felt comfortable with. Usually, you know, those who didn't go to their way to try to insult me or make me feel bad for what it was that I was going through. I wouldn't say it was a struggle that I was going through. It was just more me trying to figure out where I fit in everything. When I left secondary school, I was, I guess, in the gay phase, identifying as a gay male, but... If you know you like men, but you don't see yourself as a man, you know, what are you? You're not female, so you're not a lesbian. So, you know, what, what was going on? Upon further investigation and different circles within the LGBT spectrum, I discovered transgender. I said to myself, you know what, research this. Research what is going on, because everybody just talks about gay, lesbian, bisexual, but you don't fit into those. You're not attracted to both sexes. You're not attracted to women. You're strictly attracted to men. But yeah, at the same time, it's something about how you see yourself that doesn't allow you to fit in any of those boxes either. It made more sense that I was transgender more so than a gay boy because I never felt like I was a boy and clearly my wardrobe after 17 was nothing masculine. Because transgenders do not conform to gender norms, it opens the door to discrimination from all sectors in society. I went to a nightclub and I went to the nightclub on several occasions before and Another time I went to the nightclub and I was told that I was, management asked me to not come in. They would not take my money to let me inside of the club. I asked why. They said, I'm going to scare the women and terrify the men. I said, I'm coming here to drink and dance. Why am I going in the bathroom as soon as I get through the door? Um, um, management still does not want you in here. I said, but I was in here already. 
in the same month I was in here, then I saw somebody came outside and peeped, and I was like, okay, I know why I can't come inside because this boy told you that I am not a woman. You're gonna go to a party now where, you know, Buju Banton suddenly comes on and everybody gets riled up and then they realize they got about four bullers and a he, she in this group, kill all them, you know? That's really hard. I actually had a, a situation like that where someone, a, a classmate, recognized me and he was one who was not nice to me. He managed to make his way to the DJ and all of a sudden the music changed to that. And I felt very uncomfortable and I just grabbed a hold of some of my friends. I said, listen, I know y'all having a good time, right? But remember, when I in my car and I got the keys, I left in. So then we just got out of that establishment quickly and went to find another place, you know, to have our fun. There was one time I went into the bank and this teller was being an ass. He kept saying, Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill. And his supervisor heard him and was like, what do you see in front of you? He was like, I don't understand. Can you see a man? Um, he didn't know how to answer. So she said, okay, well, since you don't know how to answer, go to lunch. As she finished dealing with me, she apologized thoroughly for his behavior. Even though gender identity has no connection whatsoever to do with workplace performance, transgender people still face discrimination when applying for jobs and even in the workplace. Applying for a job as a visibly transgender person is hell. You will not get a job. I have enough CXCs that I can go work anywhere in Barbados, but they're not going to hire me because I can use the experience. I apply to work at a local business in town and the manager said, we would love to have you here, but you're going to scare some of the customers. I said, okay. Now, my boss, when he first hired me, he didn't realize that I was trans. A friend had recommended me to the, for the job. I tried to explain to them that I am trans, but they probably used the wrong terminology. So when I went in for the interview and I was hired, my boss thought that I was a lesbian. It wasn't until maybe about a week into the job, you know, he gets curious, getting to know his staff, and he's like, your last name is Hoffman. This is the Hoffman family originating from where? I'm like, shit, he doesn't realize. I'm like, um, I'm going to have to explain that to you a little bit later. So then I go home that night and I'm like, shit, my boss doesn't know. Suppose he finds out, I have to tell him now, well, he might very well fire me and this job is going so well. So I wrote a letter and I explained to him what the situation is. And I said, now I understand you may be concerned that I use a name that is not my legal name, but you know, I'm willing to present all of my qualifications that I presented with my resume, that you know, what I've stated on my resume is true. I do have these qualifications, just not under this name. So that's what I did, and I left it on his desk along with my resume and all the different certificates and everything. And he appeared not to have touched it for two days. So I'm like, is he gonna read the friggin' thing? And then finally Friday comes around, and he's like, we need to talk. I'm like, okay, because every now and again, you know, we have these conversations about how I'm doing at work. He says, okay, so we just wanna talk about your situation with you working in this office. And I'm like, okay. And then he goes, you know, you're a very competent person. You're efficient at what you do. The only problem that I have is that you're transgender and you didn't tell me. I'm like, oh, so you read the letter. He said, yes, I did. I was actually very shocked to read that letter. I said, well, I honestly thought that my friend had explained everything to you. But when you asked me that question about my last name, I realized something went wrong. He said, yes, because I honestly thought you were a lesbian. And I sit down there and I laugh in like hell because I'm like, I'm not in any way, shape or form attracted to women. And he's like, okay, so how do you intend to navigate at this office as a transgender person? I said, well, pretty much the same way I've been doing for the last two, two weeks. You see me come in here dressed like this. You know, I sit down at my desk, I do the work, etc. You've had no problem with it. I expect that to continue. He's like, but yeah, here's the thing, though. You're using a name that's not on your ID, and that's going to cause a problem. So you're going to have to use your legal name unless you have some documentation to say that you have changed it. And I said, okay, that's a, a fair trade-off because it's a law office and we got to do things, you know, by the book. I applied at a hotel and 
this hotel has a very big presence in the world. And this hotel said, we are non-discriminating. We invite everybody to work here. And I was the most qualified person to apply. And the head of the regional management came to me and said, I would love to have you working here and running the spa, but the person that is in charge of the spa right now will not train you because they will be intimidated by the fact that you are not biologically a female. I said, okay. So I was turned on because I was transgender. Even those providing health care discriminate. Going to a certain polyclinic and I had to get some stitches removed and the nurse, she was completely fine until another staff member came and told her that that's not a girl, that's a boy. And she frantically ran outside to call somebody else to come see me. And she left the thread of the stitches in my skin. I had to go home and take a pointed tweezer and pull them out myself. I was down for the count for about two months and I'm in and out the doctor's office. Heart rate is up. I don't know what's going on. I feel exhausted. I constantly feel sick. I can't eat, but I'm hungry. I can't sleep, but I'm tired. I can't stay awake, but you know, this is what's going on. You know, it's like my body just doesn't know what it wants to do. And of course, if you're going through all that, you're gonna start losing weight. At the time, I weighed about 200 pounds, and I think I didn't step on the scale at the time when I hit my lowest weight, but I was probably in the 160s. I just only noticed something wasn't right when I walked past a, a shop window and I caught sight of my cows, and they're looking very skinny. I'm like, damn, something is wrong. And I went to the doctor and I explained, and she said, okay, we better do some blood work to see if maybe something is going on. And it was supposed to be a generic check, your blood sugar check, X, Y, Z. And then she takes another look at me and she was like, You've lost weight, haven't you? I said, yes. And she quickly goes, do HIV testing. I'm like, I was perfectly fine two months ago. I haven't had sex in months. What's up with this? And at any rate, even when I do have sex, I use protection, you know? So it's like, what's going on? But she just took one look. Oh, LGBT person, you've lost weight. You must have HIV or something. I don't, but still, you know, to deal with that situation, it was uncomfortable. Another time I went to the hospital and I had to get um, blood done. And the nurse that was taking the blood, she lives in my neighborhood. She came home and told everybody that I went for an HIV test and I'm probably positive. And then when I confronted her, she said she does not know what I'm talking about. I said, you're the only nurse in there that knows where I live. So nobody else would know how to reach me or say that I was there for an HIV test. So I went to the board of directors and they said they would look into it and they never did. The situation with the police, the protectors of our society is no different. Usually it is a level of flippance from some of the officers. Like they're not taking the matter seriously or they would want to blame the person for what happened to them. Well, maybe if you weren't behaving like that, it wouldn't have happened to you. Why do you have to draw attention to yourself like that? And I'm the sort of person in that situation, I am not running. I'm going to stare you down and ball you out for it because it's like, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just in this place at this time. Someone saw me, decided they cannot see and not see and now this trouble has happened. But yet you want to say it is my fault because someone simply could not see and not see. So while there are slight differences in exactly how much abuse I faced, it is not to say that, you know, it's to be discounted against what others have faced. The abuse has happened because I'm trans. As soon as the police find out you're transgender, they start writing the report and just listen to you and they don't document it. Or they would say, okay, we're gonna go look for the person that attacked you after you've given the information and they never do. Or the report is never filed, or the report is lost magically. So they need some set laws so that whatever prejudice you have against LGBT persons, specifically trans in this case, that you do what you're supposed to do and not what you feel like doing or what you don't feel like doing because 
of whatever notion in your head that we are the scourge of the earth. Despite the vast challenges Alexa and Raven face, they still hold out hope that society will someday respect them for who they are. I hope that people have a better understanding as to who we are as trans people. They have a better understanding. They don't get so up in arms when they see us in public. They see us as less of some anomaly. Oh, look, that person, that woman appears so tall. Wait a minute, what'd you say? The body's a man, there's, there's less of that. You know, I'm more of, okay, well, okay, you could tell that person might be transgender, but at least they're doing what they need to do to make themselves happy. If you want to know more, you're afraid to approach me in public, find somewhere you've seen me, ask somebody if you can pass a message to me, see if I respond. I'm not a horrible person, not a monster. I usually talk to everybody that talks to me. So, or there's Google, Google it. Or if there are instances where a trans person is being abused, there are more people who would actually take the initiative and step forward and say, leave that person alone. They haven't done you anything, you know? So what if they're dressed as a woman? Is it doing something to you, you know? And there, there are not enough people that do that. There are a lot of people that just, you know, stand by or they just have their phone recording to then go and say something about it after, but they're not actually intervening to help that person. Understanding gender identity I guess is a personal thing for people. If you want to understand the person's experience, try to find out more about it instead of having your own misguided perceptions about people. You know, what really is important is knowing that people are people and that you should not stigmatize people because of their choices and because of their preferences and because of how they were born or how they look. You, you know, you have to judge people on their own merit as an individual. The Cambridge Dictionary defines a father as a male parent. Not very definitive, I suppose. So then, what's a parent? That's defined as a father or a mother. Those are all nouns. And there I was, thinking they'd be verbs. You know, like doing words. You see, when I look at these fathers, I see a man doing something and a child responding with laughter or even with tears. Whatever I see, it's a bond neither of them will forget. And then there's me, standing there, longing for daddy. I grew up with my mom, a solid woman. We had one of those cool sister vibes about us. Growing up, I didn't feel like I missed out on anything. We were pretty much always there for each other. Inseparable. I was 18 years old when I really missed my father. I always knew he wasn't there, but it took me 18 years to really feel his absence and to miss him. It hit me all at once one day, like I was a moving force heading full speed towards a solid wall of emptiness. I should correct myself. My father was not always a figment of my imagination. We used to be pretty close. At least I thought we were.
At 22, I was about to have lunch with my father for the first time. I wanted nothing more than to sit across the table from him and hear him ask me questions about my life. Of course I'd have nothing ready to say because I'm 22 and we have no idea what we're doing in life. But we'd be talking. I'd be talking to my father. Well, what? It's fine. Should I take this away? No, it's fine. He's just, he's running a little late. No problem. Hi, Mom. Okay. I said it's okay. <laughs> Growing up, I loved going to my grandmother's house. Mostly because I knew my father lived there. Every time I dropped by with high hopes of him being there, but you just missed him, were the words I'd always hear. <laughs> even this time. This time for sure I knew that even though Granny wouldn't be there, my father would have. Phone. Yeah, Gloria. You should be here. If not for Rory, for your mother. You know I can't handle neither of those things well. Plus, I know that my mother knows that I love her. What about Rory? <sighs> Rory knows that too. Look, Gloria, I... Those cards meant so much to me. I'd always imagine what his face would look like when he opened them on Father's Day or his birthday or just because I saw a cool one pop up in Hallmark one day. I never got any cards back, but I didn't care because I just loved giving them. Rory. Yes, Mom.
I couldn't hear you, Mom. I didn't want to hear you. I needed to hear you. Sometimes I just forget, but it wouldn't last very long. How could you truly forget, though? Where'd you get your charm? My dad. I was often surrounded by people who'd make me forget, but they didn't know that they'd also remind me. It was never something I wanted to forget, more something I had to learn to live with. I went home that night and I cried, like the few other nights in my past and the many other nights in my future. Roland, this is beer foolishness now. Look, my Gloria, I don't want to do this now, man. Nobody don't feel for me. Feel for you? But you don't do one ass. Gloria, we need to talk, man. It ain't me you need to be talking to, you understand? Just listen. There's a lot more to today than your father not turning up, Rory. He's sick. He's very sick, actually. But you know what? That doesn't excuse his behavior. Are you hearing what I'm telling you, Rory? Rory, are you understanding me? Can you tell me why, Dad? 
Can you tell me why you couldn't just be there? Can you tell me what I did to cause you so much pain that you couldn't, that you couldn't just be there? Answer me! Answer me! Answer me! Not so long after that, my father passed away. Gone. I mean, did he really exist? Dear Dad, I wish I knew you when I was a little girl. I wish you knew me. I wish I could say that I'm a better person because of you. But mostly what I wish for are memories. I have none. But I'm growing. Just feel like chilling. What? That Dexter, what are you doing? What are you talking about? They'll see him now, the police. Dexter, 
Alice, are you listening to me? What do you mean it's better this way? Where are you? Text the police. So cool. Thank you.